Does your family make The Simpsons look like the Brady Bunch? Even if you're far too young to get that reference, which is about half of the population, there are many of us who have difficult and challenging relationships with family members, myself included. And so today I'm sharing tips on how to deal with a dysfunctional family. So let's talk about better mental health. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeremy Godwin and I share practical ideas to help you improve your mental health every week here on Better Mental Health. And in my podcast, let's talk about mental health. This video is all about dealing with dysfunctional family members. And I'm sharing five ways to maintain healthier relationships or at least minimize your exposure to unhealthy relationships. This is a highly personal one for me. As I've shared a few times in my podcast, I have had a very messed up relationship with my mother for as long as I can remember, which at my age is a long time. After my dad left when I was seven, my mother became physically and emotionally abusive, and I lived in pretty much constant terror of her until I finally moved out of home at the age of 17. However, just moving away wasn't a magic cure, and since I'm an only child, it was virtually impossible not to be drawn back into my mother's manipulation and drama time after time, until a falling out in 2013 meant that we stopped talking to one another for more than seven years. In that time, she has developed dementia, although it certainly hasn't changed her nastiness. And so while I have agreed to talk with her again and have been doing so for over a year now because a close relative asked me to, I'm still working through how to keep her at emotional arm's length. And that's an ongoing process. So if you're dealing with challenging family members, whether it's a parent, sibling, or other relative, it can be really tough to know how to manage the situation and still look after your mental health. So today is all about tips and techniques that I have found effective along the way. Beginning with, being family does not give someone the right to treat you like crap. I have some lovely relatives, and then I have some who make the clown from Stephen King's It look like the world's best babysitter. And the thing is that we hopefully wouldn't put up with being treated poorly by friends or colleagues, so why the hell do we put up with it when it comes to family? Just because you're related, that doesn't give someone the right to treat you poorly. The sooner you wrap your head around that and embrace that idea, the easier it becomes to slowly change the nature of the situation. Because as I've said many times in these videos and in my podcast, if nothing changes, then nothing changes. And speaking of changing things, my next point is choose whether or not to engage. I talk about choice a lot in my work, and in the words of Dr. Viktor Frankl, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. You cannot control other people, no matter how hard you might try to control them, but you can only control what you do and say. And so that means that how you respond to difficult family members and whether or not you engage with them is entirely up to you. Whether you take things on board or not, whether you clap back when someone is saying something negative to you, whether you take on board other people's judgments or nastiness, all of that is on you. Now, I know firsthand how difficult that is if you're dealing with someone who, for example, deliberately goes out of their way to create drama, but you still have a choice, even if that choice is to recognize that your only option is to not take the bait. Which leads to my next point. Know that it's not about you. In his excellent book, The Four Agreements, one of my all-time favorites, Don Miguel Ruiz wrote, nothing other people do is because of you. It is because of themselves. Now I know that it's tough to hear this and even tougher to accept, especially when it's someone that you're close to, but let's be blunt here. Happy people don't treat other people like crap. You know how I said before that all you can control is yourself in terms of what you choose to do and say? Well, the other person is in full control of what they choose to do and say. And if the choice they are making is to treat you like rubbish, then that is about them, not you. If you approach all relationships in your life with a focus on doing no harm to yourself or to others, being kind to others and to yourself, and giving more than you take from others and from yourself, then you are on the right path and how others choose to behave is up to them. 
There's another quote in the four agreements that says, there is a huge amount of freedom that comes to you when you take nothing personally. Next, set and maintain clear boundaries. You set boundaries by being very clear on what you will and will not accept, and then setting limits around that. I covered boundaries back in episode 53 of the podcast, and I talked about setting boundaries with family in this video. And you'll find both of those linked in the description, or you can visit my website at letstalkaboutmentalhealth.com.au for links to all past episodes, plus full podcast transcripts. So the short version of this point about boundaries is that boundaries are those rules and limits that you set for yourself and for your relationships with others. For example, if your sister insists on calling you at six o'clock every Wednesday night, but that's when you get home from work and you're always tired, then you have two choices. You can either accept it or you can seek to change it by asking for a different behavior in a firm but fair way. So you could say, hey, I love it when we chat, but I'm just not up for it when I get home from work. How about we move our weekly calls to Saturday afternoon so I can be in a better frame of mind? So when we talk about boundaries, it basically means asking for what you need. Please remember to take into account the other person's needs as well. In that sister example, maybe she's calling at that time because it's one of the few times that she has to herself. So perhaps you'll need to negotiate and compromise. Setting boundaries involves asking for what you need and explaining why you need it without having to justify yourself and asking the other person what they need as well. And then finding a solution and a middle ground for both where possible. Next, manage your expectations. People are who they are and you can't change them. So you need to really think about what you expect from people. I used to get so disheartened that neither of my parents ever turned up to awards night or to see me perform in the musical in high school, which I did a pretty good job at, by the way. But it is what it is. Back then, I used to get upset about it all the time, but I just didn't have the emotional tools to accept that they were both people who chose to put their own needs first. If I had have been able to process that and accept that back then, I would have been more easily able to manage my expectations of them. That doesn't make their behavior right, but getting upset over things that I can never change is wasted energy. It's the same when we want someone to accept us for who we are. Whether or not someone accepts you for who you are has absolutely nothing to do with you. That is 100% on them. Yes, rejection hurts, but it's not about you. That's completely about the other person and the choices they make. So as disappointing as it can be sometimes, you need to manage your expectations. By all means, tell them how you feel and give them an opportunity to change or at least meet you halfway. But if they don't come to the party, then you can't force it. It's that old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Focus on what you need to focus on, which is your mental health and well-being, and manage your expectations. And I said five points, but there's one extra point I'd like to make here, which is you can decide what relationship you have, if any. And I believe that as long as you're being fair and objective about it, then to hell with what anyone else might say about your choices. If you decide to only see your family once a year, or if you decide to not see certain family members at all, then that is your choice. I mean, don't be nasty about it. You don't have to get into some big confrontation like it's a soap opera or cut people out of your life in an attention-seeking way. You don't have to announce it on Facebook because that just creates unnecessary drama. But be clear about what you need from the relationship. And if you're not getting it, then reassess your part in the relationship. Just because you are related to someone, it does not mean that you have to put up with nonsense and abuse. Many of us choose to spend more time with our chosen families, the friends that we are closest to, because we feel less judged and more supported. And that is always your choice. Whatever you choose to do is up to you. Remember, better mental health begins with what you choose to do today. I hope those tips were helpful. Let me know what you thought in the comments. And if you made it all the way to the end, leave me a star emoji. Catch my podcast, Let's Talk About Mental Health, every Sunday for more ways to improve your mental health and join me here for new Better Mental Health videos every Wednesday. Click here to subscribe to my channel for more weekly videos and watch this video next for even more advice for better mental health. Thanks so much for joining me today. Take care and 
Talk to you next time.